is contract automation all it's cracked up to be? Or do contract automation platforms just result in legal garbage in, digital legal garbage out? I'm Sarah Fox. I'm a construction lawyer in the UK who's pioneered contracts in just 500 words so users can read, understand and use them. But they're simple contracts. They're mostly paper. And I think it, the time is ripe for digital contracts. So let's have a look at some of the contract automation platforms and see if they live up to some of their promises of making things faster, cheaper, more accurate and simpler. I want to know whether contract automation is all it's cracked up to be or whether it's just another version of lawyers chasing shiny, shiny new tech because it's well easier for them and it saves them time and money. And that may be that allows really well qualified lawyers like me, I've had 25 years experience, to do more valuable jobs than simply being what Ken Adams calls a copy and paste monkey. So contract automation is effectively using some form of tool, whether it's a set of fields, whether it's a questionnaire, whether it's a chatbot, to populate a pre-existing template and create a first draft. Now, as you can see, the quality of the template is absolutely key to the success of contract automation. Bad templates produce bad products. The platform itself doesn't actually tell you how to design your template. Admittedly, as we'll see, sometimes some of the functionality of the platforms does kind of force you to simplify just so that you can get out of the system. But the quality of the template is still critical. So actually, if bad templates make bad automated products. But as Lucy Bassley says when she talks about innovating in law, the first thing we should look at is what tools do we currently have? What tech can we use? So I've looked at how you can use fields in MS Word to make a slightly simpler um, process of creating your final first draft. Then I've looked at the market leader contract express that I got access through as part of being on the LTIC legal technology and innovation certificate. And that's a MS Word plugin plus a platform. And I also looked at law switch again, a piece of um, a platform that we got access through through the legal technology and innovation certificate. And that's a platform. And I wanted to see how good they were at creating contracts. Now, I decided to use a contract that I'm very familiar with. It's a very simple contract. It's done uh, part of my book, How to Write Simple and Effective Contracts in Just 500 Words for Collateral Warranties. This is a second link in a chain. So it depends on an underlying contract called in this document, the project contract. So this has uh, a number of features, this contract. First of all, it's quite short. I'm pretty sure that the template is pretty good. And my book explains why I think it's pretty good. But it has some logic built in because it has either two or three parties, depending on various answers to the questions. It has two optional clauses on the screen. They're clause five, which is to do with whether or not the person giving the warranty is limiting their liability to this particular recipient or beneficiary. And clause six looks at whether the beneficiary wants to have a right to step into the shoes of the employer under the project contract in the event that that project contract would be terminated or automatically terminate, for example, due to insolvency. It will then need to be signed by either two or three parties, depending on how the questions go. So this is the baseline document that I used across all the different platforms. So we have the same template, same information going in, and I could test them against one another. So as I said, Lucy Bassley, when she talks about a guide to innovating in law firms, talks about using the functionality we already have, using MS Word, which is pretty much ubiquitous in law firms. Now, I've worked in law firms and with law firms for a long time, and I know that maybe they're not the most techie people in the world. Maybe they learn to do just enough to carry out their day jobs, but don't necessarily think about other things they might be able to do. Most lawyers, for example, still haven't got to have grips with macros. It may be that their PAs, their VAs, their um, tech people understand that terminology, but actually a lot of lawyers don't. So this is a document once it's been put into the format that you need for Microsoft Word using fields. And all the square brackets, or all the curly brackets, I mean, are field formats. 
The blue highlighting is because the fields format doesn't actually allow me to create any logic. So this still requires a lawyer to look over it to check whether or not the logic says that the employer needs to be part of it, clause five and clause six need to be part of it, and the signatory of the employer needs to be there. So let's have a look at what that looks like in practice. So this is the Microsoft Word document. It's automatically filled in the date because I've put a date field in there. And this is what the document looks like. As you can see, anything that's got red underlining is because the spell check tells me that it's an inappropriate spelling. But this is, but these help to identify the fields, so I've left them in. And you can see that there are various fill, field names in here. And the way to insert fields is quite simple. You go to File, you go to Info, then you go to properties, then you click down and go to advanced properties. And then you can see custom fields here and I've inserted these. Now, interesting enough, when I was putting these fields in, it was the first time I'd used fields, admit it, that wasn't something we've been um, doing an awful lot of in the past. The field values I put in in a bit of an unusual order. And it turns out that once you put them in, it's really difficult to change them. So I can't change the order of these fields. But if, for example, I wanted to start putting in the name of the warrant or, and I just move it from, from this to X limited, modify, and that would then go into the document. The fields are all just simple, 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 go down. It's not a questionnaire. It's not sexy. It's not, you know, uh, got a user interface that's um, exciting, but you'd end up with this document. So. What do I think about using fields in Microsoft Word? Well, it is the cheapest because it's existing technology. It requires a tiny little bit of training for staff, but there's lots of videos that you can use. You don't need to go on a training course to understand how to use fields. I taught myself by using uh, videos from YouTube and it's simple to learn because it's part of a package we're already extremely familiar with. It got a very short time in order to do it. So it took me maybe less than an hour to learn how to do it and to code it into the document. So it was fast to create the coded template, the one with the fields in. It was a matter of minutes rather than anything longer. However, whilst it is the cheapest and the quickest to do as a platform, the user experience is a bit rubbish. The interface for using advanced fields is basic. It's not easy to find. And in fact, the first couple of times I created this um, field based template, I had to remind myself how to get back to those fields. It's certainly not client friendly. This is not a document you could send to your clients and explain this is how you will fill it in. When it comes to customization, well, it's not really designed for the purpose I've put it to. So you can't adapt the field order. You can't put any logic in. You can't ask questions. You can't give guidance. So in terms of customization, it's not great. It doesn't also create or edit, um, collate data. So it's only got a basic fun functionality, but it is quick and it is cheap. So the second platform that I looked at, a proper platform this time, was Contract Express. And this is a company owned by Thomson Reuters, and they developed this um, uh, many years ago, based on a, an initial prototype done by uh, an Australian man. And this is the sort of document you end up with in Contract Express. The colour coding on this time um, is because these colour coded blue words, all in curly brackets, are variables. So we'll see variables on both the platforms. And these have simple single brackets. They don't have underscores. They have running words. And you also get something called spans, which you've got these green arrows. And this is the optional text according to whether or not a particular variable has been chosen. So let's show you what that looks like on the platform. So this is the Contract Express platform. You get a widget. It's not very exciting. I'm not going to show you what that looks like. But this is the questionnaire that I designed. And one of the things that you can do uh, whilst 
previewing and testing your questionnaire is also to preview the document that the information is going into. So the minute you start adding information about whether it's a contract, the date of the contract, um, where it's going to be held and where the project is going to take place, it starts completing it. We can put in optional clauses so we can decide whether or not we want a step in clause or whether we want to limit the employer's liability and that will then include or delete the relevant clauses. And we're going to put a limit in of £1 million just for the sake of it. And as you can see, we can continue to add in information. And we can also make sure that the information that goes in, as you've seen, goes in in the right format. Because I tried to put one and an M for £1 million as a shorthand, and it only allows me to put in numbers because I've coded that into the questionnaire. So the other thing that you can do in this is to include where you have the name of a company, a warrantor's name. As you can see further down on the left hand side, the questions have warrantor name, not a very um, nice looking question. But the minute I type in name of the warrantor and press return, it changes the future questions to take that into account. So this is quite a sophisticated system. The user interface is very pleasant. So let's. I think about Contract Express? Well, I understand that it's one of the most expensive platforms to get, and particularly for a small business, a small consultancy, maybe we're not its target market. I did need specialist help with this um, automation because when I started putting um, the document in, although I could test it as I went in Microsoft Word, it would tell me there were errors, but not tell me how to solve them. So it was quite time consuming to learn. It took me over two hours and two lots of specialist help to carry out, complete my questionnaire. So it might seem simple in terms of its structure, but it was slow to learn how precisely to draft them. There were five different boxes for every single question and variable to make sure that I'd covered it all. It's maybe slightly faster to use than chat box, but it's still a very time consuming thing for what is essentially a very small document. In terms of user experience, however, Contract Express is good. It was easy to test and upload. I could use Microsoft Word to start, then I could put the questionnaire, then I could use the platform. The coding was a little sensitive when it comes to spans so that you can't code before or after a number, you have to put it in a very specific place. But it would be relatively client friendly because it has quite a nice user interface. In terms of customization, as I've shown you, you can use variables in future questions, which makes it a bit more um, pleasant as you go through, because particularly for clients, they might not constantly think in defined terms the way lawyers do, a contractor, subcontractor, warrantor, beneficiary, etc. Company names might suit them better. And there's good built in logic with dynamic questions. So it is eminently customizable. So Contract Express is a market leader for a reason. But that doesn't mean that it's easy and intuitive for lawyers to use to create templates and questionnaires for their own documents. And again, once a template goes in, it's kind of fixed. You can change the template, yes, but it doesn't automatically encourage you to make it shorter. And in terms of accuracy, well, because the amount of questions that you have to put in against the variables doesn't automatically make it more accurate. You can't get to the end without answering all the questions but you and you can build in sort of structures around those questions so you can't answer in the wrong way but that doesn't necessarily mean you'll end up with a better first draft than if you'd done it all manually so the second platform i looked at was law switch now this is a chatbot platform really but you can automate contracts from it. And I wanted to see how easy it would be to do it on Law Switch. So again, we've got the same baseline contract, and this has now been converted into um, the Law Switch variable. So the variable's not in blue, but they're double bracketed, they're underscored. You can see where they go. It looks very familiar. We also have these logic steps, which are like the spans in Contract Express to decide whether or not particular items are in. This is what the platform looks like. And you can put all sorts of different um, chatbots in here, but this is my warranty generator. So let's have a look what that looks like. 
in preview. So I'm not going to go through how you would build uh, a chatbot. I'm just looking at the preview of this um, chatbot. So you can come up, you can build it onto your website. You can have it on a front page. It asks various questions and particularly it wants to know who I am and what my email address is. So it can send me a copy at the end of the session. Now, it's quite um, easy to answer because it asks for various bits of information and we can have all sorts of different drop downs. We can ask whether they're a contractor, we can put in the name of the contractor, still X limited, and we can put in their address. We can put information in the question which leads you to a specific answer. So this, as you can imagine, is pretty um, easy to use. some nice functionality. So how would I rate it? Well, in terms of cost, it's cheaper than Contract Express, but it's obviously more expensive than using MS Word. I did need specialist help. So I spent about three hours doing this um, and automating it. And yes, these were both the first time that I'd done the field and Contract Express and Law Switch. So you would get more experience, you'd get quicker, you'd understand its quirks as a platform. But the thing that LawSwitch wouldn't let me do is to explain why I was having problems. So when my template was uploaded, if there was a glitch in the template because the variables were wrong, then it wouldn't give me that feedback until I'd gone all the way through the questionnaire and then it would just say error. So I did need specialist help. As I said, this takes the longest time. That's why the clock is the furthest round. It was the slowest to learn. It was relatively slow to create because you had to work out the logic yourself. It didn't kind of lead you in quite the same way as Contract Express, but it was a bit faster to create the documents by going through the chat. And I think in terms of user experience, because it's chatty, because it sends an email at the end, it can send an email saying how you filled it in and a link to the document to both client and a supervising solicitor or lawyer or legal executive who might want to oversee that the contract or a document that a client has created is legally efficient. You can easily give clients direct access to this. And because it's a chatbot, it's pretty easy to follow. But as I've said, it's harder to test errors. And it does have this kind of sensitivity of variables because the variables in the document the variables in the questionnaire and the variables in the email have three different types of name for through it for each of the variables. So that means it's just a little bit more complicated. And if you can't copy and paste the document tags, which I was struggling to do, then you have to write them down and the, the error rate was higher. I think a chatbot, well, some people love them, some people hate them. So I don't know whether that might create a kind of a, a bit of a polarized user experience. In terms of customization, I could do everything that I needed to do um, and could do under Contracts Express. I could have dynamic questions. I could put logic in there. I could make it flow the way I wanted it to flow. So all of these platforms had their pros and cons. And I really want to think about now whether contract automation is the right solution for our clients' problems. Because currently, a lot of contract automation problems are solving the boring process bit that lawyers already do. Clients get the same product out of the end of it. The same templates are used for Contract Express as they just be used in a precedent bank. So we're not necessarily creating documents which are easier for clients to read, understand and use. But more importantly, none of these solutions, none of these tests that I did looked at a data-driven contract. It seems to me that one of the things that we've learned is actually we need access to our templates wherever we are in the world, particularly when we're working from home, but also in order to check performance when we're not there all the time, we might need performance management based on data. And that means having a platform which captures some of the data that we need to manage contracts. Now, one of the platforms I tested, but I'm unable to show you, is called Mortar. And this is a project management platform designed for the construction industry. And 
it works on a very different sort of basis. It's looking at data. It's looking at is a contractor's application for payment backed up by the data that they support it with, the timesheets, the automated login information, and so on. So its view of contracts is not as a product in themselves, but as a means to an end. So when I started putting um, this same format document into Malta, I ended up with a much longer contract, only in terms of page length though, not in terms of words. I had to use um, tables to put some of the data into. Now, tables are great because once you've specified a cell, you can reuse the information in future things. So the tabular format and the data-driven aspects of Mortar were great. In terms of what we're expecting to see as a product out of the end of it, well, it doesn't really look like a contract that you and I would understand because quite a lot of my sections only had one sentence in. So it was 10 pages long, but only 10 sentences long. But I think that instead of creating just digital templates of digital versions of our existing templates, our existing contracts, which are based on being a product in themselves, we need products that integrate much better with the other technology that our clients are using, that provides information and data that our clients need to run their businesses more effectively, to understand what's costing them money, where, people, where suppliers and their supply chain aren't performing. I think a data-driven platform is a far more useful tool than a contract automation platform for the sorts of things that I do. But I don't know. What do you think? Are the contract automation platforms you're experiencing just putting legal garbage in and getting digital legal garbage out? Let me know.